Hi, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for being here. Everybody in Hollywood is a multi-hyphenate these days, but there is no one more deserving of that title than today's guest. I had to write them down, and I'm sure he'll tell me I've missed some, but he is an actor, a writer, a director, a novelist, a journalist, a documentarian, a biographer, a singer, a model, a muse, an activist, and a humanitarian. It is my great honour to introduce Rupert Everett. Hello. Thank you. Hello. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. OK, let's start at the beginning. OK. <laughs> Tell us how you became an actor. How I became an actor? Yeah. Well, um, it really started, I, I loved, um, I, I went to this, it's unusual for people nowadays, it, it's difficult to imagine, but when I was a kid, we had a local cinema, and it was one of those gigantic uh, places, and it was called the Embassy Theatre in Braintree, in Essex, yeah. and um, it had these amazing pink curtains, and <laughs> I suppose I became an actor and a queen on the same day, because... <laughs> These curtains were lit from underneath. I don't know whether you, probably the uh, people, older people remember this. And they were just, they were crimson, kind of um, tangerine colour. And the film, which was Mary Poppins, oh. uh, it, they projected before the curtains were open. So it looked like it was coming out of the curtains. I had a completely different vision of the idea. I had no idea it was coming from behind. I thought it was coming through these curtains. And they swished open. And uh, Julie Andrews came into my life. And um, <laughs> it was just a mind-blowing uh, um, situation for me. And the first bit of acting I did was going straight back to school and telling all my friends that my parents, who were a rather boring middle-class military people, weren't my parents, <laughs> and <laughs> that I was actually Julie Andrews' daughter. <laughs> <laughs> and she was busy filming in South Africa. I don't know why I'd invented South Africa. And she put me with this very dreary family. And <laughs> I was making the best of it. <laughs> oh, God. Um, now, you were sent away to prep school at age seven. That's boarding school, which, you know, the British upper classes do. We were just talking about that. You know, I went to boarding school at 11, and it's uh, very difficult. But once you got to your, you know, more senior school, Ampleforth mm. in Yorkshire, that's where you really you know, started to act in school plays. I mean, you have said, I don't know if you were being slightly facetious, you know, it looked like I might be a homosexual and therefore perhaps I should learn to act. <laughs> no, what, what was the truth in that and, and how did you start um, acting at school? Well, uh, I was at a monastery, uh, a very strict, not very strict actually, a Catholic uh, monastery, and it was, uh, it's, it was very sporty and uh, they played a lot of rugby. And uh, there was a theatre run by uh, a teacher, and all the oddballs in the school really uh, congregated in the theatre. And uh, funnily enough, I met a, I made friends with two people, who both of them um, still friends with me now. And one of them, Julian, who's in my film, uh, mm -hmm. we left Amberforth together. We both went to the same drama school, and we were both in the same first West End production together. But when we were at this school, we became really the lunts of the Amberforth stage. He played all the boys' parts and I played all the girls' parts. <laughs> and uh, I made myself this amazing dressing room on a fire escape. Uh, and I got a mirror with, uh, with lights around it and like skeletons for wig uh, things. And I had tons of telephones and I'd have pretend conversations, which actually were very prescient. They were exactly like the conversations yes. ended up being with Italian agents and uh, we'd write each other letters. There was, a, there was an inter-house kind of letter system in our school mm -hmm. and we'd write each other letters from Franco Zeffirelli and um, <laughs> people like that. And then we then we both saved up our pocket money and got this magazine called PCR, which is a magazine that shows what acting stuff is going on. And once we saw there was a film called The Boys from Brazil. Uh, mm -hmm. So I was at this point playing Mary Stuart and Julian <laughs> had, was playing uh, Queen Elizabeth. Uh, the first, and so we wrote to the producers of The Boys from Brazil saying, we are boys, and uh, we're currently p appearing in uh, Mary Stewart at Amberforth College, and we'd like to be in the film. Uh, and so that's, how, that's really how our careers got started. We didn't get into that film, obviously. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> now, did you apply to multiple drama schools? I, mean, I applied to uh, two drama schools, uh, the Royal Academy in London and the Central School, and uh, I got into both, as a matter of fact, and went to the Central School. 
And can you talk a little bit about what happened there? I what you happened? weren't there for the whole course and had to leave because of insubordination. Yeah, I, I <laughs> Which took what form exactly? I think because I really misunderstood the nature of things uh, mm -hmm. a lot. Because there was show business and the real world look like they're on the same track. But actually, and this it took me years to discover, they're not on the same track at all. Show business is like being in the military, uh, which was the world mm -hmm. I tried to escape. Actually, I'd gone yeah. back into a, 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 an organization that is just as militaristic. At the same time, the 70s were happening, and it was disco, drugs, gays were the thing. I mean, when you think about it, especially in America, gays and black people, we were, we were, we were the stars of the 1970s. Mm -hmm. And so being gay uh, and young, then, even though it actually in, in England it had only been legal uh, to be gay mm -hmm. for seven years, but you felt the world was your oyster. I had no inkling that show business was running on a completely different uh, set of rules with yep. a different constitution. And um, so I got to drama school um, and I just really was, was very rebellious because it was, it, was, it, was it was very dreary. Uh, at drama school too, and I'd imagined drama school was going to be full of cross-dressing and orgies <laughs> and, um, <laughs> and everyone experimenting with everything, and, and it just and it wasn't like that at all. And um, and I and, and I imagined show business was going to be like that as well. And so I had a kind of collision really with show business for the, at least the first ten years of of my career. Is there anything you did learn at Central though that you took with you when uh, you ran away to Glasgow? Tons, in a way. I mean, we did. We did. It's, it's uh, the old-fashioned training is an amazing uh, uh, training. It, it they teach you things that you never learn anymore. Uh, the kind of a breathing technique called rib reserve, which was really uh, the kind of thing that um, I mean nobody does now. But it, it's a it's an amazing technique. And and I had a couldn't say CHs properly. I learned how to do that. And uh, we did tons of plays. Um, and so, yes, there was something great about it, uh, looking back. But it was, it was bureaucratic uh, in the way, uh, in, in, a, in a boring kind of post-war, um, lean-to building-ish kind of way. But you then found a different kind of training which did suit you at the Citizens Theatre in Glasgow. So how did you end up there? Well, in those days, in our country, and you don't have it the same here, uh, and, but we, our union situation was much more complex than your one. Uh, we had to get a union card to start with, and there were only 40 or something given out per year, which is an extraordinary thought now. Yep, yep. And there must have been about, I think, 200 drama students per year coming out of the drama schools, and each repertory company around the country had a union card or two union cards sometimes to give out. And so for the young actors coming out of the schools, it was very, very competitive, mm -hmm. because without the union card you couldn't work, and you could only work, you had to work once you got the union card for 50 weeks in the provincial theatre, and only at that point could you take part in television, cinema, or the commercial theatre. So uh, this, of course, was something we all complained about, but in fact it was a wonderful uh, thing too because your real training happened to you in some either good rep repertory company mm -hmm. or some terrible repertory company. Either, either one was actually <laughs> just as good as yeah. the other. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but I went to one which had been my favourite, which was a very, very, an incredible theatre. And actually, in, in, in a way, the only part of my show business journey that really has lived up to everything that I thought it was going to be. It was called the Citizens Theatre in Glasgow and it was a, f a famous theatre throughout Europe and it was a kind of very design oriented uh, uh, place which was alien to the British theatre actually at the time and, um, and I spent um, really all my theatrical career uh, started from there and I went back and back and most of the plays I did commercially were there in the end from there as well and uh, the director uh, this man called Philip Prowse and the designer, he's, he's really been, was my mentor, I think, on, on everything. And remains so. More, remain more so. on him later. Um, so for many of us, the first time we heard of Rupert was when he was on stage in London in another country. I saw it when I was still at school and every teenage girl in England thought he was the most handsome boy they'd ever seen, <laughs> myself included. Um, obviously, uh, he was on stage with Colin Firth and then... I wasn't actually. Oh, you weren't? No. Oh, I thought I... Oh, okay. So who, who was in that initial production? I was sure I saw both I of you. I was on the stage with <coughs> Kenneth Branagh. Oh. Wow. Um, not Colin Firth. Wow. But Colin Firth took over the play after 
I left the show and then Daniel Day-Lewis took over the yep. show, my part, mm -hmm. and then Colin Firth took over from him. And uh, that's an interesting thing. They always say to you, if you ever get a hit in the theatre, you should never, ever, ever leave it. Because if you yeah. leave it, someone else will take over your role and do it much better. Yeah. And uh, <laughs> that's exactly what happened to me, because I was the, the king of the pile yep. when I started yeah. out. And uh, they just went streaming on ahead of me after they took over from the show. Now, what I'm unclear about is the gestation of the play to the movie. How, how did that come about? Was the movie already in the works, or the play was such a hit? The play was a great hit. Happened. It lasted for about three years, and uh, it was a friend of mine, one of my best friends who produced actually the film, my, my film now, uh, produced it uh, in London. And then we together, uh, we were, Alan Parker was going to make mm -hmm. it into a, a movie. And uh, so... That didn't actually happen. Alan didn't do it, and in the end, uh, Marek Kanievsky. But it was about two years later the movie happened. And did you have to re-audition, or were you offered it? How did no, that I was happen? really... It was my project, right. really. I'd, yeah. taken, I'd, I'd taken the play f uh, to the West End producer mm -hmm. initially, because it was in a little tiny theatre outside of London. Yeah. And, um, and so I was really in uh, uh, at, the, at the construction of it. And so casting the other role was uh, part of my, um, one, of, one of the things that I had some control over. And uh, I'd seen Colin in uh, another country, in, the in my role, in the mm -hmm. play, and I developed an enormous crush on him. So I thought, I've <laughs> got to have Colin first, and we've got to get rid of Ken Branagh. And, uh, <laughs> and um, I won through and got Colin. And uh, then we started working on it uh, on, on the film, and my crush just turned off like that. <laughs> and uh, uh, I went from crush to loathing him and being really nasty. <laughs> and uh, we were we were really bad enemies uh, for that whole period. But um, we became great, great friends after that. But he actually disputes that and says now, you know, I love the idea of a feud. Is that really true, or is wasn't that a bit a of dramatic embellishment? No, it wasn't a feud. Yeah. I was just very nasty. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> It wasn't a feud. Uh, I was just. A, uh, I was a why? Because I was a nasty piece of work. <laughs> I mean, in, many, in many ways, uh, I was. Uh, I was very territorial, mm -hmm. uh, and um, and you know, I, I I was I was in some respects quite a nasty piece of work. And presumably, his talent was already well evident at that stage. Yes, and I was probably very jealous of it. Yeah, yeah. So, how did that film change things for you? Um, well, both Colin and I, the weird thing is that uh, the film here, over here in America, was distributed by uh, Tom and Michael uh, at Orion Classics, and they're one of the few organisations that are still going now, and they are Sony Classics. So ah. um, it's an amazing, actually, thrill and a kind of uh, full circle uh, <coughs> thing to have had them do my first ever yeah. film and this one uh, now. It's extraordinary, because there's very few people in a... In a executive uh, layer who, who is still doing the same thing and they're, they're a, an amazing couple and they brought me and Colin over to promote the film and um, it, was, um, it was quite successful. So that was your first taste of Hollywood really? No, no. it wasn't ah. my first taste of Hollywood because <laughs> before the film came out I'd been in a miniseries called Princess Daisy and wow. um, we shot that here in Laguna Beach, some of it. Wow. But what were your first impressions coming here to promote a movie? Well, my first impressions were doing, uh, doing Princess Daisy. I, I knew about the Chateau Marmont. Ah. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, I said, I want to say the Chateau Marmont. Thinking that the Chateau yep. Marmont was going to be... Full of glamour. I don't know, people. full of glamour. But yep. at that period, it was the most extraordinary hotel. I remember arriving on my first day and almost wanting to commit suicide. Every room had little kitchenettes of, yep. with these horrible scuzzy cupboards with old, thick white china. You had two teacups, two, uh, um, two saucers, two plates, and a, a kind of drawer that pulled out. I mean, from, nothing had changed since the 1950s nope. in that hotel. The carpet was that kind of old. It, there'd been tons of... You could just smell the broken dreams <laughs> um, in, uh, in, in, in that hotel. And... Uh, but then the Marlboro Man was outside, oh and, yeah. uh, and and it was not that long ago. And yeah. uh, it was an extraordinary, you know, it, extra Hollywood is so different to how you imagine it because, of course, you get there, and if you don't know anyone, you're like in a kind of bubble, completely on your own. You don't know how to get anywhere, go anywhere. You're normally stuck on your first yep. trip where they leave you, and <laughs> this idea of it being 
you know, uh, kind of a hall of fame uh, uh, all over the place is, is, is completely, it's a completely different type of experience. Yep. But once I got used to it, I, I, I liked it very much. So back in the UK, he followed up another country with a film called Dance with a Stranger about the last woman to be hung in the UK at the age of 28. Her name was Ruth Ellis. Um, she was played by Miranda Richardson in her first breakout film role. Correct. And she killed him. <laughs> uh, can you talk a little bit about that? I mean, it was a huge success for both of them, certainly cementing your initial success in another country. Um, it was a, 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 di a really uh, difficult experience for me, and it's where I, f I really s began to come up against the reality of show business. Um, the director and I didn't get along at all well, and I think, or thought, it was because uh, I was playing a straight role and he knew I was gay, and he wanted to rehearse and rehearse and rehearse these tiny little scenes uh, where I had to either kiss or make love to Ruth Ellis. And I could tell what he really thought, and this is actually, I think, really the essence of homophobia, if there is homophobia in Hollywood. It's not about um, hatred or aggression. It was about a kind of boys' club attitude who just couldn't believe that a gay person would have the first notion about how mm -hmm. to make love to a woman. And I was sitting there opposite this man, hauling me over the coals, and he was a big, fat, slobby thing. <laughs> and I had, at this point, already had wonderful affairs with some of the world's most beautiful women. And I thought, yeah. what, is, what is wrong with this yeah. picture? How can yeah, I yeah. persuade this yeah, man yeah. that there's no problem mm -hmm. uh, with me yeah, playing yeah, yeah. the scenes? Yeah. And he just would never let me go. And we developed this incredibly abrasive, um, aggressive relationship. And of course, I, being 22, had no idea how to control myself. And as I'd said already, I was yep. already perched yep. on the verge of being quite difficult. And that kind of pushed me uh, into, um, I don't mean to sound like Serena Williams, but <laughs> it pushed me into, <laughs> it kind of pushed me into going too far. And I, and I, I was at loggerheads with this guy. And, uh, and in the end, I lost uh, because um, I think my reputation was kind of blown because of it. But it came from this thing that, that is, is a kind of this, I don't know whether it's the same now, but it's certainly in the 80s and the 90s and right at the beginning, this, this boys club notion that uh, a gay person could not play a straight role. Mm -hmm. And of course, every straight actor is playing gay roles and you know, getting Oscars and winning and they can do everything, but yeah. it just doesn't work the other way. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think that is um, the thing that has been most frustrating in a career, I think. Mm -hmm. And a hypocrisy that prevails to this day, really. Well, I yeah. think uh, things are definitely shifting. I mean, everything is, everything is up for grabs mm -hmm. uh, today. Yep. Uh, so things, uh, th things are definitely on the move. But yes, it is, because even in the last few weeks, uh, there's been a scandal. I don't know whether you've heard about it here, but Disney have been making a film, and they cast a straight guy um, for the gay role. And obviously, everyone in England who's gay and of equal stature, or even actually higher mm -hmm. stature, then this guy is, uh, is probably fr frustrated at about it. But I think we shouldn't be happy in just playing the gay roles. Why can't the gay guy play yeah. the straight role? Yeah. Uh, um, uh, and the straight guy is playing the gay role. Why do we have to be confined to playing the gay role? Um, so I think um, it is a, it's a frustrating situation still in many respects. Yeah. Now your first American film was Hearts of Fire, perhaps, you know, not one of the best reviews of reviewed of your career, but you did work with Bob Dylan. Can I worked with Bob Dylan, yeah. and actually, um, from my, I, I was, I think I was very good in that film. Yeah, I, uh, I, <laughs> I would agree. It, it was one of the films yeah. that uh, I think I was misunderstood in. You yeah. know, all actors think they've been misunderstood yeah. uh, nonstop in their careers, but I felt I had this friend called John Taylor <laughs> at the time, who was um, the bass guitarist of Duran Duran, yeah. and I think I did an amazingly accurate yeah. takeoff yeah. of him. Um, but um, nobody noticed. <laughs> uh, so uh, and, it w and 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 they're probably right. And um, it was a, a, a strange experience. And the the first director I killed because poor old Richard Marquand uh, died in a parking lot during the edit. No, mm. <gasps> that's terrible. Now Bob Dylan's not known for his conversational 
well, not skills, but you know, he's not a great conversationalist. He's a bit of a mumbler. How did you get on with him? I adored him, and uh, we had such a laugh together because he was—he <coughs> is so dysfunctional, or was. He didn't have any hours, so uh, his life was. He might be up until 11 a.m. in the morning and have mm -hmm. three hours sleep, and get up at two and stay up until nine, and then <gasps> go go to sleep till midnight, and then get up and stay up until four in the morning, have another nap. So uh, working in the in the in the military schedule of a, of a movie, having to get up at four, he'd just been he just normally spent the whole that was his going to bedtime. So uh, he was constantly in a daze. And one time we were doing a scene together in a limousine. And uh, sometimes you well you all know you do uh, if the if you're not doing the scene with the car actually driving we were in the studio and uh, they were just bouncing the car around and having lights flashing by outside and stuff like that. And we were sitting in the back of the studio playing this, uh, in, the, in the back of the limousine, playing this um, you know, kind of rock and roll scene about, you know, I love that track, man, and uh, uh, all that. And you saying, yeah, man, you know, you're going to be the top. And uh, anyway, we played the scene for about the whole afternoon. And, but Bob thought we were driving back to the hotel. So oh, no. when, <laughs> when we opened the, the limousine door to get out, he said, where's the hotel? <laughs> it was hysterical. But you never knew with him whether he was doing it on purpose or he was doing it to wind yeah, you up. Yeah. But it was yeah. so funny. And he had these little tiny thin legs and always wore a big parka jacket with a hood. And so yeah. he'd like, and these, this kind of hair. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and uh, he was t very, very funny. Yeah. Now, about that time, you did have a fledgling moment of pop stardom, or you recorded an album. After that, yeah. Right, um, and, and, you, and were managed by Simon, Simon Napier-Bell, who was a famous music manager in Svengali in London at the time. Mm. So what went wrong there? Um, <laughs> <laughs> what went wrong there was, um, I don't know, I think first of all being on my own, because uh, when, you're, when, you're an, when you're an artist in that world on your own, and you, what happens is, Every weekend you go on these, um, you go to festivals or TV shows, and I, I, there was another band uh, it, with my record label called Living in a Box, oh, yeah. and uh, there yeah. were four of them, and <laughs> I had such fun, everything was fine when I was with them, but on your own, you know, you have to have nerves of steel, actually, to be on your own, and it's like being a stand-up com comedian, yeah. actually, as opposed to an actor, and you have to know when you're getting into that th sort of thing that you're not with anybody else, you're on your own. And that I couldn't, um, I was too conflicted. And, and, and remember, the other thing that had happened uh, at this point for in our lives is that AIDS had happened. And I was very lucky in the sense that uh, in eventually I, I, I didn't ever contract it. But, you know, the, the, the 70s, uh, everybody had, you know, had tons of sex. There was no way of um, finding out if you had HIV or not. And uh, suddenly to be thrust A in front of the camera uh, when you thought, God, maybe tomorrow someone's going to come up to you and say, what's that on your face? Mm -hmm. And you're suddenly going to be outed. And then going even further and being on your own uh, making records. I think um, for me, the strain of that, uh, and that's, that's also what made life very difficult at that point because uh, you know we lived in a kind of terror situation. I don't know if anyone's old enough to remember that period, but I mean, it really was a, a, a terrifying, terrifying time. And you saw friends mm -hmm. uh, and the disease, you know, even people who get the disease now don't look like people mm -hmm. looked uh, when it first came out. You l it looked like something absolutely uh, terrifying. And so even when you had friends and you had to deal with your friends having it, uh, it, was, it was also terrifying. And um, I think being in front of the camera and being looked at uh, with that in the background of your life was, for me, uh, it took me a long time to, looking back, to recover from. I didn't really notice mm -hmm. at the time because you're just keeping going, but it was, um, it was very stressful. I remember uh, on the TV show I did Princess Daisy, uh, I was uh, shooting a scene in England and something bit me on, and I came up in this lump and you can actually see if you watch the film. I just, I, I'd gone into the train. I thought this is this is it. And I'd gone back and played oh. the scene. I just couldn't even bother to play the scene. I thought, oh yeah, well. Um, yeah, and yeah, you could yeah. actually yeah. see if you knew oh, wow. uh, that I just lost the plot completely. And um, so I think that was, uh, and also obviously in terms of music, I wasn't um, good enough. 
Mm -hmm. So, you know, all those things come together when you think about it. Yeah. Now, around the time that you came out, which was 1989, you also made The Comfort of Strangers, in which you were, you know, fantastic. It came out before that, really. All right. <coughs> right. Well, yeah, but... Yeah, I mean, everybody knew, but, uh, but it wasn't that sort of the official time. But, but anyway, nonetheless, you were you know, still playing a straight man fabulously in The Comfort of Strangers mm. with Helen Mirren, Christopher Walken and Natasha Richardson mm. in Venice but not Venice. I don't know if anybody's seen that. It's a beautiful, languorous film based mm. on um, Ian McEwan's novel directed by the great Paul Schrader. And how was that sort of experience? Because you, you have talked about having had a difficult professional relationship with you know, Natasha, who, of course, sadly is no longer with us. How do you look back at that film now? Um, uh, well, I didn't really have a difficult relationship with Natasha. I, knew, I, I was very good friends but with you, her you father. You said that, yeah, and yes, her husband. yes. And uh, but you said that you weren't <coughs> terribly close. <coughs> no, we weren't. Uh, we weren't uh, particularly close. But I don't think we had a no. difficult relationship. No, no, no. no. Um, I was. I was very good friends with her husband and her father, and uh, and and not such good friends with her. Um, but uh, that experience was amazing. Paul Schrader. Uh, is um, an incredible uh, director. And that my coming out hadn't happened in 1989. Oh. It happened oh, in okay. 1986, if, if oh, anything. Okay. Right. Because in 1986, I, I moved to France. And that's really where everything kind of changed in that sense for me. Uh, in 1989, um, Paul came to see The Vortex, a play that mm -hmm. I was in, uh, directed by the guy, Philip Prowse, from the yep. Glasgow Citizens. and. He um, offered me the film, A Comfort of Strangers, and we made it in Venice, and uh, it, was, uh, I, it was great. Uh, Helen and Christopher and, and uh, Natasha and I had a, it was just the four of us in the film, and uh, it, was a, it was a wonderful experience, really, looking back. Yeah, it looks beautiful. All right, well, fast forward. And it's an amazing film, actually, yes. in, in its way. It's one of the, I mean, you could, no one would ever make a film like that nowadays, but uh, it's a... Uh, it was an amazing, uh, yeah. weird film. Yeah. Now, Ready to Wear must have been a fantastic experience with Robert Altman. Ready to Wear was quite a few years later. Yeah. Um, uh, Ready to Wear was... Um, 94. 1994. And it was a difficult experience, I think, because Bob Altman was not very well. He'd had a heart attack, uh, I think, two weeks before shooting started. And uh, he, uh, making a film about fashion is a very, very difficult uh, thing. And I don't think he'd got his head around, really, the intricacies and the, um, the amount people would really look at it through a microscope in terms of the, just the technical thing of what fashion really was like and how it actually operated. So I think he was always on the back foot and he realised that kind of at the beginning of the film that because he had his, his son who's a, a good mm. designer, but yeah. he's not in, the, the design and the look of it was just not, they didn't bother really to look too closely at what fashion was actually like. Um, so I think uh, in, in one sense that film could have been wonderful, but, um, but was, was less good than, than, than uh, everyone had hoped. Mm -hmm. But it, it's wonderful working for Altman because he has such a, an incredible way of shooting. Uh, and uh, he has all these cameras at either all corners of the room and uh, you make up your own dialogue and yep. some of it was absolutely amazing because we shot at real fashion parties where yeah. all the actors had to w move around with the real uh, fashionistas and the camera where you'd suddenly s find yourself uh, with the camera uh, and you'd have to uh, come up with uh, one of your little scenes and that was uh, very exciting and great fun. It must fun. have been thrilling for you. It's lovely. Yeah. It was divine. Yeah. OK, fast forward a few more years to a little film called My Best Friend's Wedding, which obviously changed everything for you here. And although that film is more than 20 years old, it more than stands the test of time. And I wonder if you've seen it recently and, and what that experience was like for you. Um, it's uh, it's, it's um, 20 years old last year, 1998, 1999, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, this year. And um, it's... Um, I haven't seen it recently, um, but uh, I love it, and, um, and I loved P.J. Hogan uh, and his wife very much, and it was really a, a mm -hmm. period where, in show business, I suppose, I started getting on with everyone much better uh, at that point, and uh, I'd never really worked with a director, not really, who ad adored me, and I adored him. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, we really got on well, and uh, he called me his De Niro, and I called him my... Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, my Marty Scorsese, 
and uh, and uh, we had and the, the other actors were wonderful. Julia was great. Cameron was amazing. Dermot was lovely, and um, it was just a, a very lucky period for me because. Um, I got on so well with PJ and he kept writing me new material mm -hmm. and, um, and so it was a kind of one of those dreamlike uh, experiences where everything suddenly turned into green lights all the way for me. But was that down to working with the right people or had someone ever taken you aside and said, Rupert, you have to stop saying some of these things, you have to be <laughs> nicer? No, 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 it was just, no, because uh, really on paper when I got the role, I felt it was like the end of the road. And by the way, I wasn't nasty mm -hmm. uh, as, as a person uh, for the most part. I wasn't, uh, I, I, the nasty side was really a little bit earlier. Yeah. Uh, All right, so you were over that. I don't think I was uh, particularly nasty in um, doing um, the Paul Schrader movie, no, for no, example, no, no, none of that. No. Uh, so I think. Uh, you're not the one that says this about yourself. No, but you're but I, yes. I said it about yeah, my yeah. first yes. people. Yeah, I didn't yeah, say yeah. about yeah, yeah, yeah. you then yeah, inferred yeah, yeah, yeah. that I didn't yeah, get yeah, on with yeah. Natasha Richardson. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Anyway, um, um, but no, because the, on paper the role looked uh, like it was a very kind of dead end role. It was a one one and a half scenes uh, uh, in a, in a really? film. Yeah, and it wasn't a, a great. Wow. Uh, there was nothing in the role, and I thought um, I thought it was kind of the end of the road in a way. But mm -hmm. uh, once I got to to meet PJ and uh, to know him, uh, then then it just kept changing, and he kept writing all this other. Um, material for me. But I think, in answer to your question, no. I think just that um, getting on with people and, uh, and, and I don't know, PJ was so, he just, you know, we, we clicked uh, very, very well. Uh, and, um, and the opportunity was there. And uh, I clicked very well with Julia as well. And uh, that was important. And, um, and, and so had great chemistry. And we had good chemistry yeah. and a good laugh. And, um, and so it was, a, it was a wonderful opportunity in mm -hmm. the end. And PJ and I, we made another film together afterwards yep. called uh, Unconditional Love, mm -hmm. and, uh, yep. which I think is a, is a wonderful movie. Yep. And, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. But never got released. Yeah, yeah. Why not? What happened with it? Well, that was part of then the kind of downturn for me because uh, after my best friend's wedding, um, I was taken up by uh, the community as being yep. a possibly a new type of uh, star that could bring in, you know, a potentially 20 million strong audience of uh, gays and lesbians and, mm -hmm. and transgender. So I think I got a lot of opportunity for that. And uh, so then I, I, I did the film with Madonna, The Next Best Thing, and it tanked. Mm -hmm. And the moment it tanked, I think, uh, it made people sit up and look twice. And meanwhile, I'd made with PJ uh, Unconditional Love, and uh, it had gone fairly extensively over budget. And then that, too, uh, was pulled before it was shown. And so for me, that was kind of you know, uh, the end of the road, slightly. So, so what was your feeling then after that film was panned so randomly as it was, cruelly so, I thought? Um, well, I didn't, uh, you know, I didn't really notice at first the, the real Ram the, the ramifications. I think when, when something bursts like that, uh, it takes a few years for you to really understand what's going on because uh, uh, I'd got quite a lot of work out of mm -hmm. uh, all this yeah. and so the work kept going and, um, and uh, I didn't really notice what had happened until a couple of years later really. Um, and, um, and then it was like uh, everything just started slightly going wrong for me in a way and uh, I wasn't getting the roles and then it just literally stopped dead. Um, and um, that was when I started writing. And what was the first thing you wrote at that I wrote my point? first book uh, called uh, Red Carpets and mm -hmm. Other Banana Skins and, uh, <laughs> and then I uh, started, that we were now about 2006 and, we, mm -hmm. and it brings us up to starting work on this film. And since uh, my career had kind of stopped dead in its tracks, I thought I'm just not going to accept this and so I thought I'd write myself a role mm -hmm. uh, that I could, you know, worm my way back in with mm -hmm. and so that was really the initial uh, motivation for me to um, play Oscar Wilde. Yeah, but we have bypassed your two big important Oscar Wilde movies, The Importance of Being Earnest and An Ideal Husband. Right. So talk about those two films, both directed by Oliver Parker, 
both excellent, both Miramax films. Uh, I mean, were you involved at all in getting those off the ground? Um, I wasn't involved in uh, getting the ideal husband off the ground. No, I was. It was. I was approached by them, and um, I, we did it, and we had a lovely time doing it. And so we then had the idea, I think, all of us together, really, to to do uh, the importance of being earnest, and uh, that was also in that period. I think the importance of being earnest was probably in two thousand and five or something like that. Two thousand and three, um, and. Um, 2002, The Importance 2002. of Being Earnest and Ideal Husband, 1999. Right. Yeah. Um, and then we also did together the St. Trinian's films, yep. uh, which, which I don't think so fun. have come here. <laughs> but uh, we did two of those. Um, In and which you play a man and a woman. <laughs> which I play a man and a woman. And, um, and that was, that's kind of it in, in, a, in a nutshell. But at what point did you start thinking, I need to play Oscar Wilde? When did that well, seed first germinate? Around that time, uh, the that I wasn't really getting after those jobs, uh, uh, after the importance of being earnest, I didn't really get any particularly good jobs that I wanted. And, and the kind of roles that I was offered were uh, just, you know, it's, it's difficult. It's difficult even when you're successful to try and broaden uh, your game, really, because normally you're just asked to play the same thing over and over again. Mm -hmm. um, but, um, but things really kind of uh, uh, tanked and bottomed out in a way for me. And I just thought, uh, what kind of role should I try and play? And uh, it felt to me that something that I could write and really put everything of myself into as well uh, would be uh, the story of, of Wild uh, in Exile, uh, who for me is a kind of uh, patron saint figure or a Christ figure almost. Mm -hmm. Patron saint of fallen celebrities and... Not, yes. not so much for yes, for, for celebrities, yes, I suppose, and but more than that, uh, patron saint of the gay liberation mm -hmm. movement, which is really what he is. Uh, um, the 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 road uh, to gay liberation really started uh, with the Wild scandal and Wild's death in 1900. So I think he's a very important punctuation point for us living in the LGBTQ plus mm -hmm. community now, and uh, for me. I think a, a historical context in life is incredibly mm -hmm. valuable and I think one of the things that the virtual world is missing uh, is any context historically and mm -hmm. now we're all like goldfish swishing around the bowl once and, and that's about as far as our, uh, as our historical sense takes us to a year or two ago. You know, the idea of an old movie is Scream 2, not Scream Absolutely. 1. Absolutely, yes, <laughs> um, yes. And, um, and I think this is very difficult. It makes, things, it makes it very difficult for us all to deal with life as it is, mm -hmm. actually. Absolutely. I feel. But was there a point when, I mean, obviously you were offered all of those roles of you know, upper, class, upper class handsome men. I mean, was there a point when you tired of those sort of offers? To be honest, no, I've never, I've never been offered. I, I, I've normally taken work that's been offered mm -hmm. me. Uh, I think, uh, you know, only in a few tiny periods of my life have I been offered many alternative uh, sources of work. Uh, I've normally taken the work that's, uh, that's come, to be honest. I'm curious how you're received by kids in America, because you've made an awful lot of family films, you know, Dunstan Checks In. So that's uh, one of my favorite yeah, films, yeah, right, I, Dunstan I, Checks yes, In. I came, yeah, I came, I came on, on the set for that, but was there, e I mean, was Did that, you? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> a long time ago, but, but was there ever any intention to, to broaden in, into those sorts of films, or those were just offers that came along? Uh, Inspector Gadget was another? Inspector um, Gadget was one. It wasn't such a successful one, nope. funnily enough, to me. Um, no, I would love to have done uh, more kids' films. Uh, I think uh, it, uh, um, Dustin Checks In, I think, is a, is a kind of wonderful yeah, yeah, yeah. movie in a way. Yeah. Um, and I really enjoyed working with the orangutan, was, I think, one of my favourite scene partners yeah, yeah. ever. Um, <laughs> Because that orangutan was just amazing, and yeah, yeah. they were so trained. And you could, you, when you acted with the orangutan, you could do a four-minute scene with the orangutan, and you gave it, or the or the trainer behind you gave it his little movement. So you said, "I'd say," and he, and uh, he could do all these different yep. things, and you could play the whole scene. And uh, there was there was one Sam, and he had his sister, who was his stand-in, and uh, he was he was such fun. And I used to wear a little front-piece wig. Uh, in the thing, and he would watch the hairdresser coming up to me and doing this to the wig. 
and he'd sit there. And at the beginning of the scene, you had to take control of the orangutan, and uh, the trainers would give you the, 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 you have to say, okay, Sam, don't get goofy. And he'd go like that. And don't get goofy was a sign that he was yeah. going to have to start the scene. So I'd go, Sam, don't get goofy. Yeah. And he'd go, okay, and he'd already started disrespecting me. And at one point, the hairdresser had gone, and I'd gone, don't get goofy. And they said, oh, an action. And Sam just looked at me and came up to the wig and went <laughs> and put it in his mouth. <laughs> it was amazing. It was so funny. That's oh, fantastic. Uh, obviously, there was no better choice to play uh, Prince Charming in, the, in Shrek 2 and 3 than you. How did that happen? That was uh, one of my great lucky windfalls yeah. because uh, being in the Shrek uh, films was an amazing piece of luck because I didn't know whether they even pay so well. No, mm -hmm. but in those days, or the, or the Shrek franchise, uh, it was everyone got paid really good money, yeah. and uh, the work is, you can do it anywhere in the world. If you're in uh, Hong Kong, they'll hook you up to a satellite, and uh, and the films were amazing, and uh, the tours we went on were amazing, and honestly, it was that was the best job I ever had. In everyone a way. says that, yeah. Really the yeah, best yeah. job, it was such a laugh. And, and also because they were so good, the films, it made it even, even more less guilty making. But, um. Yep. Um, an audience member wanted me to ask about stage beauty. I'm not sure who mentioned that. It's one of your favorite films. It is? Um, I love it. Oh, yeah. wow. <laughs> yeah. You're very good. You're very fine. Oh, thank you yeah. very much. Thank did you. Did you enjoy it as much as she did? I loved making stage beauty, <laughs> and it was, uh, it was, it really did, it went down really badly uh, everywhere yeah. for some reason. But yeah. um, I, I, I really enjoyed it, yeah. But why do you think that was? Too actory? I think essentially because they tried to, uh, it, it was about this, um, well, drag uh, mm -hmm. uh, uh, actor and he was not heterosexual in real life mm -hmm. and they'd made the story into a kind of heterosexual love story and I think people uh, at some level found that unbelievable and, or untrue and uh, so I think it, um, it was slightly hoisted by its own petard in a way. Uh, from Beth, what do you know now that you wish you had known at the beginning of your career? Oh, I, I know one thing, uh, <laughs> and uh, it's to do with and it's to do with directors. I think, and I learned it from working with myself as a director, um, because uh, making my film uh, quite often, I didn't manage to perform what I wanted to perform because I was so busy trying to do everything else. That sometimes I really slipped up, and when I was editing the film, and you've got all the material, and I knew the things that I was trying to achieve in the acting and I could see you know through the in all the rushes what I wasn't achieving and I obviously cared about my performance a lot I could you know with intensive editing and moving and moving things around and cuts and things I could make I could build my performance back into the performance it should have been and uh, at that point uh, and when you come in to an edit the editor normally does a does a does a a run on all the performances, but quite a lot of the, the editor's choice is made on whether the bird is singing in the background or the tr car's not going past or something's happening. And quite often the, that editor's choice is quite flat from the actor's point of view. And we actors, we always go to films and, and things like that and say, God, why did they choose that, uh, that take? It's, uh, um, do you remember that one I did? It was fantastic. <laughs> uh, and, and I reckon that that's true because unless the director really likes you, He's got so many things to do. He hasn't got time to go through your performance mm -hmm. with a tooth comb. He'll leave it uh, to, to, to an edit and, and, and will never question or think about how he could make it like 60 or 70 percent better. And if the, if the director doesn't like you, then you're fucked, basically, because uh, he's never going to bother. So I think my, the only thing I've learned is, you know, whatever, make the director like you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> You were living in Paris for quite some time mm. and you know, made several European films. I mean, what was that period like for you and, and what did that do for you professionally and personally, that period? Oh, well, that's, that was my, my first really clever idea, I think. In, in 1989 in Europe, mm. uh, European cinema was meant to be born as a mm -hmm. kind of, uh, as, a, as a form on its own. And I had been here 
for quite a few years on and off uh, trying to get jobs and not really succeeding. And I suddenly thought, well, why don't I really not go to the Hollywood, try the Hollywood route? Why don't I go to Europe and uh, try and be a, a pioneer uh, European mm -hmm. film star? So I moved uh, to France in 1986. And uh, of course, the European cinema wasn't really ready to happen. Uh, the French are incredibly nationalistic and mm -hmm. protective of their market. They, there was a kind of co-production type of thing that wasn't really terribly modern, that you'd find yourself working with a Yugoslavian actor, speaking a little Yugoslavian, and you'd be speaking English, and someone else would be speaking French. And, uh, and it just never really worked out. But I, I went to France. I made qu quite a few films. In Italy, I made uh, three or four films. In France, I made a couple. And I learned those languages, and I think it was the. Oh, you didn't learn those languages until you. Had until moved I went there. to no, not really. Wow. That's and uh, that was amazing for me, really. And also, what coming <laughs> coming in at the tail end of that amazing uh, period in Italy, I think mm -hmm. was the thing that that really made me. If my film's any good, it's because of meeting all those people, um, meeting uh, Dante Ferretti, uh, meeting uh, Piero Tosi, people mm -hmm. who probably don't mean much, but they're they're the there's an, there's an aesthetic uh, depth in, in those Italian movies from the 50s, 60s, 70s and 80s um, that is um, unbelievable. Gianni Quaranta is an amazing uh, production designer, Danilo Donati, all mm -hmm. these characters who made uh, Visconti and De Sica yep. and Sergio Leone, all these incredibly textured films um, that really leave behind the rest of the world in terms of how films look and uh, I think uh, so that was an incredibly important uh, part of, of my development definitely for making my film. Yeah I mean did languages come effortlessly to you because now we have apps to learn them on which is so easy. Um, they did then they don't anymore um, they, ca they come at a certain age languages come easily mm -hmm. to you. Uh, I think um, after a bit, it, your brain uh, stops being linguistic. Somewhere. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. It's true. Um, so moving on to your new film, The Happy Prince. Mm. If you haven't seen it, it's released in Los Angeles and New York on October the 10th, and then we'll go wide. It is a masterpiece, a mm. tour de force performance. Hit the reviews in the UK have been fantastic. I'm sure they will be here also. Um, I mean, it was incredibly difficult to raise the money. There's a fantastic documentary called Born to be Wild. I hope that it will become available here, which tells the long, <laughs> you know, arduous um, journey. But, you know, what kept you going throughout? And I, I know it was difficult. I mean, it's an emotional piece to watch, you know, the film and the, the documentary, documentary, knowing your journey. Um, I don't know what kept me going, to be honest. Uh, I just um, uh, because it, it was such a long journey and I, I'm fairly flaky person by um, traditionally and um, I think probably just desperation um, kept me going because it was such a long period and in the middle of it I was about 55 years old this is not a good time mm -hmm. for actors even if they're doing well really because you're not one thing or the other you're not young and you're not old and uh, so I was in the middle of this process my career was like I don't know the light at the end of a receding tunnel and um, <laughs> Often, about two or three times, I thought the film was happening and I'd cancel it, some work that I had and then it collapsed. And it was uh, at a certain point I thought to myself, um, God, if I don't make this film, who am I? Uh, and that's a horrible, um, mm -hmm. it's, not a, it's not an ideal uh, state of mind. But I think it was that state of mind that kept me pushing through. Uh, I thought I've got to, I have to make the film uh, or else, uh, you know, I might as well be dead. And... Um, Mm -hmm. And so, uh, and so, th and also, because filmmaking is very enthusiastic and optimistic thing. Mm -hmm. uh, we live on optimism most of the time. So, if one something happens one day, you think, "Oh, there you go, that's it. Yeah. I'm going. I'm off again." Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, and so, lots of those kind of things happened yeah. as well. Now, nearly every actor who directs themselves say they would never repeat it again, and yet you seem to have pulled it off with incredible aplomb. It's such a you know creatively directed movie. Well, you know, I love clearly your European with me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but clearly your time in Europe, you know, influenced it enormously. I mean, how did you 
I mean, once you're actually, you know, you had the money and you're thinking about the directing, I mean, what was your vision for it? Had you had that vision all along or did that come together as the movie came together? No, I knew always how I wanted to make it and also to a certain extent how I had to make it because mm -hmm. of the constraints of, of the budget. Uh, if I'd had, um, you know, 40 or 50 million uh, pounds, maybe I would have made something more conventional and more... Uh, uh, you, you know, with, with camera work and, um, and using places and sets in a more conventional way. But I, I had a very limited means. And also, I, I didn't want to make uh, something quite that traditional. I, I, I loved the films of um, the Darden brothers mm -hmm. in uh, Belgium. <coughs> and they make films, they're urban films, so they're not the same yeah. as, as mine, but they make films that look as if they're kind of cheaply shot documentaries. In fact, they're in heavily, heavily choreographed, brilliantly choreographed, mm -hmm. um, uh, handheld uh, films. Films, and um, and I and a, a lady called Andrea Arnold uh, yep. also oh, yeah. developed yeah. from them uh, her version of doing those kind of films. And um, so I knew that I wanted to try and make a kind of Visconti meet CCTV mm -hmm. kind of aesthetic. Yep. Uh, uh, with a with a with a documentary style and with with some face off between the the actor the protagonist and the camera, uh, which I have at the beginning and the end of my film when I talk to the camera, and hopefully not to sound too wanky but you know establish a relationship yep. between the camera and the film uh, that the camera becomes an actual physical observer of the thing, because once the actor looks into the camera's lens, there is there should be or hopefully a, 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 a contact established, and then the camera follows the actor down into wherever he goes. So that was um, really what I wanted to try and how I wanted to try and make the film. And I, was, I think a director's real work happens anyway, I think, before, making, before shooting starts, oh. because he has to choose the other mm -hmm. people. And if he chooses the wrong people, uh, that's how the film unravels because the wrong person is just not going to be able to do the thing that the director wants. And I chose great people. And mm -hmm. first of all, I chose uh, an amazing uh, DP who just uh, was like, he's like a big rugby player. And he just <laughs> pulled me through the whole thing. And we were really on the same page about everything. And the production designer was an old friend of mine. And the costume designer was an old friend of mine. And I knew exactly what what I wanted to get from them. And I had amazing actors who, uh, and all of them, mm -hmm. right across the board, right to the smallest parts. I coerced everybody yeah. I knew into the film. And uh, so I didn't need to make any effort with any of the actors. Uh, they, were, yep. they, were, they just effortlessly inhabited uh, their roles. Yep. So in, the, in one sense, I was incredibly lucky. And a great editor and a great musician, uh, composer. So Gabriel Yared, uh, who, <laughs> who I discovered uh, when he composed Betty Blue, starring Beatrice Dahl, who is also in the film. That was another huge film of the 80s, for those of us mm. uh, around then. <laughs> um, but the incredible thing to me is still the fact that without your old pal Colin Fur, you wouldn't, wouldn't have, happened. have got it made. Right, there you go. I mean, which is so mind blowing, it really is. Do you really call him frothy? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> So talk a little about your conversations because, you know, he, he was attached and then years went by, and, but he always stuck with you. He did. Uh, I, when I first wrote the film, which is, must have been about 2007, what you do is you have a reading and Tom and Emily and uh, Colin uh, came and read the film. And Tom Wilkinson Tom and Emily Wilkinson Watson. And Emily Watson. And I got them, all three of them, to sign these pieces of paper through their agency saying, we will take part in the film, which is what always happens. These pa pieces mm -hmm. of paper are not worth the paper they're written on because yeah. mostly people <laughs> manage to back out uh, if the movie ever gets going, which normally yeah, they don't. Yeah. And then uh, the years went by. Colin's career skyrocketed after um, A Single Man. And uh, I, meanwhile, uh, was ferreting around Europe trying to get deals promising Colin Firth and saying things like, you know, I spoke to Colin this morning and he said, you know, when are we getting started? And, uh, um, which was all lies. Yep. And, um, and then all the deals were written with Colin, uh, only as provided Colin took part. So I was absolutely desperate. I didn't know what would happen if, if he backed out. And he never did. So um, he, the film really is made thanks to him. But were you surprised at that? Very. 
um, because, you know, especially in show business today, in the old school of show business, everyone did everyone favors. But nowadays, show business has become a much crueler um, machine. And, you know, nobody can, nobody would pour a bottle of water over you if you were on fire <coughs> uh, on the whole nowadays. So I think Colin's behavior was incredibly unusual uh, for, today's, uh, for today's world. And um, I don't think anyone has done anything for me like that uh, in, my, in my life so, so generous and uh, so huge. I mean, for me, huge. So it was but it wasn't entirely a favour. Colin says in the Born to be Wild documentary it was one of the greatest scripts he's ever read. Yeah, and you can imagine, no, no, I'm sorry, it is a fantastic script and you can imagine how many scripts he was, no, you know, give yourself credit <laughs> where credit is due. No, but anyway, um, he, was, yeah. he, he, ca he came up, uh, he was amazing. And so were the others too, um, Emily and Tom, you know, sticking with me and, uh, and doing the film. And Colin, I, he was being paid a certain amount of money, and I had to take half his money from him as no. well before the film started because oh, no, he ran out. Oh, so, no. uh, and he accepted <laughs> that too. He was amazing, really amazing. Wow. Mm. So you were securing financing from assorted different European countries, and that was contingent on shooting in those places. Yeah. So how incredibly difficult was that? You had such a short shoot anyway. Um, you were racing around Europe. It wasn't that, it, it actually, it wasn't that short a shoot. We had about a 50-day right. shoot, which uh, was actually, in a way, quite a lot. Mm -hmm. uh, but yes, the main problem was that the film had to be shot in Germany, uh, where Oscar Wilde didn't go. Yep. And, uh, so, and in Bavaria in Germany as well, which is a very rich state. So every bit of architecture is uh, remodeled uh, and uh, sandblasted and wonderfully preserved and completely unusable. Uh, if you wanted to, you know, create a seedy 19th century Parisian uh, environment. But finally I found um, this area in the north of Bavaria called Franconia, uh, where near Bayreuth, where Wagner came from, and I found these three old castles. And uh, in the old castles, I really, we used them like a studio. And uh, almost every room uh, that, of the film is in one of those castles. Mm -hmm. So it was very lucky. That was another lucky thing. So you're acting and directing and spending hours in makeup every day, presumably. I mean, what was that transformational process for you like daily? Not, it didn't take Not very long, know? to be honest. I mm -hmm. had a, p a set of teeth with um, extra bits on the side uh, that um, made, my f made my face a bit fatter. I had uh, this amazing fat suit. Uh, made How did that feel, having that in your mouth? Uh, um, fine, OK. Yeah. Uh, uh, yeah, like, like you had swollen gums. Mm -hmm. And, um, and it didn't really took a very short time by the end, getting ready. So that wasn't too difficult. Um, and, and really, the, making the film was, in a way, the easiest part. M easier or yeah, less yeah. stressful than the, than the on again, off again um, you know, pre-production. But you say now that you didn't actually enjoy the process. Was that just because there was too much to think about? There's too, too much to think time. about. And also because we were, you know, every day it was packed with work. And if we didn't do it in the day, like most independent films, you just don't do the scene. That's the scene gone. So you've, you're spending the whole day just pushing and pushing and pushing. And so that's not really fun, exactly. Mm -hmm. um, now, as part of the preparation for the film, you also played Oscar Wilde in David Hare's play, The Judas Kiss, right. which won you a Best Actor Award for from what's on stage in London. I mean, obviously that's a different period of Oscar's life, but you felt that you had to do that to show these investors that you could any, do this. I hadn't got this. any investors. Oh, that was even before. Uh, so, so that I did the play because I, wasn't, I had no investors. Mm -hmm. And I thought, well, maybe if I could show myself playing Oscar Wilde, I could get some uh, interest. And uh, so David Hare gave me permission to do the play. And Robert Fox, who did Another Country with me, put the play on and uh, at the Hampstead Theatre Club and, and it was luckily very, very successful and I got um, the BBC to come on board my film then and Lionsgate and that's how the whole thing got started. But how did the experience of playing him in that film in in inform the your role Oh, in the enormously. Film? I think if you can be in a play playing a character before doing a film, it's wonderful because I did that play for about a year on and off and yeah, I didn't uh, realize you went to New York and no Toronto, Toronto and, and New, New York, York yes and on tour in the UK and uh, it was I really knew the role um, or my character anyway by the time I finished doing that so by the time I got to the movie I didn't really need to think too much about my approach to the role mm -hmm. so I think that was very useful yep 
And the other incredible part of the film is that much of the dialogue is in French, and obviously he's fluent now. <laughs> I mean, was that a conscious decision early on that you would do that? Well, I thought it, I, I think it's too late in 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 to have people speaking English with French oh, yeah. accents, oh, yeah. and uh, it, and yes. uh, and also I was very much still involved uh, in this idea of making a European film, and it seems that uh, I thought my film is naturally European. It's made in lots of different European countries. It speaks naturally in European languages, and uh, I was excited to try and uh, to make a European, uh, a very European film. Is there anything you would have done differently? Tons. I mean, you know, I think yeah. every film is like a work in progress, mm -hmm. and you know, you you can only do what you can do, and you know, even we had no money left for post production, so it was edited in ten seconds, you know, mm -hmm. compared to what it could have yeah. been, and I could have edited it for much longer and come up with many different things. But so you you have to kind of be fatalistic about that. You can do what you can do. I think all movies must be really a work in progress somehow. And do you regard Oscar Wilde differently now? No, I have the I, I, I had uh, I had a very clear insight, uh, my very clear insight into him right from the start, and it never really changed. Funnily enough, how emotional was it filming the death scene? Um, not very, <laughs> because uh, poor Tom Wilkinson yeah. uh, was having uh, a kind of um, he couldn't breathe, oh, no. and so he kept saying, "Oh God, I'm going to faint." And I was going to say, don't faint. Uh, <laughs> uh, don't uh, steal this from me. Uh, you're only here for one day. Just do it. Just keep going. He's like, and he said, oh, I've got to sit down. And I was going, we've got to, we've got to, we've got to get going, yeah, yeah, yeah. Tom. Yeah. And uh, then he had this hat. And I said, Tom, you're meant to put your hat on your head. Oh, do I have to wear that fucking thing? <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and so he was, I'm feeling so ill. <laughs> and so it wasn't that sad. It was, uh, it, was, uh, it was a worry. But it was a fight in the end. Yeah, he yeah. was amazing. Yeah. So here you are, back on top again, you with CAA. Middle. Everything's coming up roses for you. How does it feel? Um, well, I feel um, um, f good. It's very nice, you know, coming to LA again uh, after all this time and uh, seeing everything change. No more hamburger Hamlet. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no more House of Blues. Yeah. Um, everything's changed a lot. Yeah, uh, and um, so I'm just kind of getting my bearings. You know, for us English actors, this place is such a—it's mm -hmm. a place we pass by all through our lives uh, in various different rentals and houses and flats and hotels, and so it has a kind of very romantic uh, side. You know, it's Hollywood after yep. all, and it's a—it's a—it's the place of dreams, and so it's—it's uh, it's funny to come back after such a long time and see Sunset Boulevard so full of traffic, yep. which never was uh, before. Yep. And those high rises, everyone. And those you new must high rises that look like they they've been plucked out of Chechnya. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yep, <laughs> so true. So, so what's next for you? Um, Cindy says, "Is Noel Coward next?" I mean, he's certainly <laughs> Who's due Cindy? for some attention. Oh, you? Cindy? Um, no, it's not next for me. No, no, no. Not at the moment. <laughs> Although I love Noel Coward. Um, I don't know what's next. I'm, I'm, I'm. Uh, I've written another film that I'm trying to get off the ground. And, um, what is that? It's a story takes place. It's a kind of disco story in the seventies. Wow! Wow! Well, wow. which you know all about. Which I know oh. all about. <laughs> and would you direct it? I would. And are you in it? I am. Wow! <laughs> <laughs> Tell us more. I, well, well, it's not. I don't think it'll yeah. ever happen, probably. But um, that's what I'm trying to do. Um, and Put the positive vibes yeah, out there. Yeah. It, uh, well. It's just financing independent yes. movies is yep. really tough yeah, nowadays, yeah. and uh, and they get more and more expensive too. But there are so many more platforms now. I don't know, uh, are there? Well, I mean, what, you know, what about all the streaming services? You know, I mean, Netflix are you know making some like eighty movies this year. I know, but to get yeah. to Netflix, you know, there's uh, it's it's quite difficult to get you know yep. to get all these people engaged in your work. Not that easy. Yeah. So where is it set? It's set in Paris. So it ah. needs to have French money, really, yeah. because uh, that's the only way you can get all the tax reductions. So, so it's, all those things are quite complex. Mm -hmm. So who do you think is the audience for The Happy Prince? Because to me, I mean, it's such a vast audience. Just for example, I had a, a young Lyft driver yesterday, a brilliant young gay guy uh, studying at Harvard, and he didn't know who Oscar Wilde was. And I told him all about the film, really? and he said, yes. Really? You're yes. amazing. Thank yes. you so much. Yeah. And I told him all about it. And he said, oh, you know, my partner and I were just saying we need to go and see some films. And I said, well, you know, a you need to see this one. 
Yeah. He, well, he, yeah, he, his partner's in uh, sat studying in San Diego right now, so he's going back to Harvard in oh, January. Right. Oh, right. But a brilliant young young guy, I mean, phenomenal, and doesn't know who Oscar Wilde is. I mean, I'm not surprised, and, and you know, why necessarily should he? But you know, I, I mean, the the audience for this film is surely everybody. Well, I don't know. Um, I, you know, you always hope that you, that everyone could go and see your film. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, I'm, I'm not sure. I, I hope um, it'd be lovely if everybody went to see it. Amazing. Yeah, yeah. I mean, looking back, do you feel like maybe you're a little ahead of your time for Hollywood? Um, ahead of my time? Oh, I don't know. I mean, you're just so incredibly talented. You can Aww. do. You can do anything. Well, I couldn't before. And, well, <laughs> well, I, mean, what I do could you only mean? do this now. I don't well, think I would. Well, have. Yeah. I, I, everything happened to me later than I should have done because I think no I don't think I, I think I'm after my time because mm -hmm. if I'd had been able to write a film in say the year 2000 mm -hmm. I'd have managed to make the film with no problems uh, here because I was quite popular uh, and it, what was so weird is that it, that happening when it was too late to me or developing mm -hmm. a, a, a knack for writing if only I developed it earlier I had tons of opportunity earlier on. I had development deals for tons of different ideas and I could never pull them together. So that's the weird thing mm -hmm. for me, having the opportunity and not being able to use it, losing the opportunity and then being able to do what you hadn't met, bothered to do before. Yeah. I mean, it's also incredible that you didn't get a TV show off the ground. You said you had development deals all over I the did. place. I'm you had your Mr. Ambassador yeah. series, mm. which would have been fantastic and could still happen. <gasps> I, could I mean, why, why not? <laughs> bring Mr. Ambassador why back? Not? Oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, but, I mean, why, why did none of those shows come to fruition? Mr. Ambassador uh, was, uh, oh God, just took forever. It's not because it's not that easy. Yep. It's, you know, if it was that easy, everybody well, would be so doing things. There are so many pilots made and so uh, few. I, I made up. the pilot, and uh, I didn't. The sh I, I got a showrunner that I, I, we didn't get on very well with each other, and uh, that's really no, what you happened. didn't. <laughs> that's, really <what> <laughs> that's all in his fantastic book, Vanished Years. Highly recommend it. <laughs> well, again, yes, yeah, because I guess it's about finding the right people. But, but were there any other shows that came close besides that one? Um, yes, I made. I wrote a show for Channel Four in London uh, called Boy Band, and it oh was about wow. um, uh, four young Liverpool boys uh, mm -hmm. starting it, becoming famous, and uh, that nearly got got uh, got picked up and didn't as well. You know, getting picked up. It, all this is like it's as random as a sperm hitting an egg. <laughs> uh, <laughs> really, and it, yes. and it, you, when things do happen, you think, my God, it's it's a sheer miracle. Yep. Uh, so it's incredible yeah. when things do, you know, manage to get born. Absolutely. You've worked with so many people. You've met so many people. You've partied with Andy Warhol and David Bowie. And I mean, is there anybody you're still dying to work with? To work with? Yeah. And or meet? Um, I, th I think meeting people is overrated, actually. Yeah. It's, um, <laughs> I think um, people are much better to... If you, if you come across yep. someone on the screen or in a record, uh, I think it's best to leave them there. That's, yeah. where, um, that's where you'll enjoy them the most. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but working, yeah, tons of people I'd like to work with. Like? Well, I, I spent a couple of weeks with Richard Dreyfus recently, and I would love to work with him. He's sensational. What were you doing with him? We were, on the, uh, we were doing these... Uh, film festivals in Italy mm -hmm. and um, him and his wife were on the, we went, went to three film festivals together in different parts of Italy and he is hysterical yeah yeah he and is. him talking about for example the 70s in Hollywood is yep. just one oh, of the yeah. most uh, because the 70s for me is a, is the period I would love to have been reborn in not that it was a very gay friendly actually time mm -hmm. but but the Hollywood when Hollywood is run by the inmates of the asylum really uh, in that decade and it was an amazing amazingly creative place where the, com the commercial cinema was was eclipsed by the 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 art cinema and they were all the same I mean it was mm -hmm. a, an amazing time I just want to ask you about a quote of yours and whether it still rings true I don't think many actors are that good to be honest I certainly don't think I am I think there's good parts more than good actors. That's what I, uh, what I meant by that. Is that I think if there's mm -hmm. a good bit of writing, a bad actor will look very good, um, it, and a good actor will look wonderful. If there's a bad bit of writing, the bad actor will look bad, and the good actor will look bad too. 
mm -hmm. and I think uh, you can see that uh, play out all the time. Absolutely. I mean, a lot of actors now are given the advice to you know, write and try and create their own projects. I mean, would you give people that advice if they're stuck and not finding the parts that satisfy them and all they can get? I don't think advice is a very nice thing, really. Yep. Um, I but they all ask for it. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think anyone, people shouldn't yep. ask for advice. Right. And because giving advice is just making other people try and be like you. It's very mm -hmm. controlling. Nobody could be like you, really. And, <laughs> and taking <laughs> advice is very um, submissive. Mm -hmm. And I don't think people should take advice, really. People have got to find their own, own way. But I, I think, yeah, tons of actors now want to uh, take their own destinies in their hands, which is uh, amazing, I think. Mm -hmm. And just one final note, you said during the play that you had felt the spirit of Oscar Wilde yes. with you. Mm. What about during the film? Uh, well, I wondered if he'd left me during the film <laughs> at one point. <laughs> but um, <laughs> um, but uh, I don't think he did, no. I think he, um, I think he stayed with me and uh, I feel um, a great deal of warmth um, researching the, the film and also because there's so many you can find out really everything about someone like Oscar Wilde know mm -hmm. what they're doing you can go to every street corner you can go to every house and that is that that part of the journey for me I loved discovering the villa where he lived in Naples was for me mm -hmm. one of the great moments of my life uh, you know walking in the footsteps and stalking them and then thinking oh, it was like this uh, and uh, that's uh, and then you really start to feel people yeah, and will you just quickly tell them that special thing of his, sort of of his, that you have, the hand story? Oh, I have, um, a, 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 um, someone gave me a um, plaster cast of his hand that was made by um, a medium that he used to go and uh, visit called the Sybil of Mortimer Street. And, there's, uh, and I was, I've got one of the hands, which is amazing. Where is it? It's on my desk in London. Oh, wow. Lovely. I don't take it with me everywhere. No. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> I should. I know. And on that note, bye bye. Thank, Thank you, you very so much, much Rupert. Thank, Thank you. So you. Wonderful. Thank you.